but kind of going back to, to those early days, were there any, uh, any actors that you kind of drew from or were there any movies that kind of inspired you to kind of? Oh, a absolutely. You know, um, I guess, you know, Pacino, it's almost, I hate that my influence is going to be so obvious, but Pacino, early Pacino was a huge, huge influence on me. Um, I, this, the movie Serpico had a very big effect on me for some reason. It was really a groundbreaking movie because that was one of the first movies where the lead character, it was kind of an anti-hero. He was a, mm -hmm. you know, it, personally, he was a bit of a jerk, but yet you were still rooting for him because he was doing the right thing. So it was kind of a, and, and I just thought it was an amazing movie. I, Sidney Lumet is one of my favorite directors. I just thought Pacino was exceptional in that movie. And then Dog Day Afternoon was just, so that whole period of films. And then of course, Mean Streets had a big effect on me. And I remember seeing De Niro in um, Bang the Drum Slowly. Do you know that movie? Most people don't know it. I've only he, heard of it. I haven't seen it though. Yeah. You know, it's an early De Niro movie, and believe it or not, he plays a Southern baseball catcher, but deep Southern, who's not very bright, and he's dying of Hodgkin's disease in the movie. Uh, and he's just, and then you see that, and then you see Mean Streets, and then you see The Godfather, and you're going, so those, those were the ones that really got me early on. You know, and of course, as a young, younger, I was, you know, I liked Humphrey Bogart and, and those kind of guys early on as well. But when I, once I started acting, I'd say Pacino and De Niro and Duval, uh, those kind of guys had a really big, big effect on me. Yeah, and you mentioned that you, um, you know, you got into uh, theater at a very young age. Um, did you ever take on uh, writing? Have you written any projects or do you have a passion for writing at all? do have a little passion for writing i just don't have the discipline for writing i did <laughs> believe it or not uh most people can't imagine this uh i actually was head writer on a, a kid's show for nickelodeon called wienerville in the oh. early 90s oh wow so, which was a kid's puppet show and uh so but that's a different kind of writing i kind of felt. i used to write comedy for a comedian um so i do have a i I do have a feeling for, for doing that. And I, I have stuff in my head. I just don't have the discipline to, to get it out. Yeah, because, uh, you know, Little Carmine was a producer. You know, he used to make oh, yeah. movies. So I was wondering if, that was, if any of that was, uh, you know, based on, uh, on Ray at all. But it uh, looks like it was different. No, no. That was their idea. I don't even, you know, I'd love to ask them how, how they came up with that. Because there was nothing up until we started up until uh, Christopher Michael said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making a movie with Little Carmine. It's like, I had no idea Little Carmine was making movies until they, they said that. I remember where it was at some party. I think it was a DVD release party. And I didn't know Michael that well because I never had any scenes with him. Michael Imperioli, I'm talking about. Yeah. But Michael Imperioli is also a writer and he had written several episodes. Yep. So he was always in, in the writer's room early on. He knew how s s uh, stories were going to get developed. And my character was kind of n not so involved in the business any in the in the family business, so to speak. And then we were at a, a party, and I was I had some cousins with me, and I remember Michael walked over to me and he said, "By the way, Ray, next season we're going to be doing something together. We're going to be making a movie." And I was like, and then he like left, and it was like I didn't had no idea what he was going to talk about. So I I, I do want if ever I get on Talking Sopranos, I'm going to ask him that question because he had inside information. And I was wondering if that was just their way of keeping my character around a little since I wasn't so involved in taking over as being boss. So whatever it is, I was grateful because I thought it was a, it was a funny, funny storyline. The whole Cleaver storyline, yeah. I think, was, was great. Those were, those were some of my favorite scenes of, uh, of season six because they just it made you guys seem real. It was almost like you were playing yourselves, even though it was the characters, but like seeing you guys in Beverly Hills and kind of interacting, you know, with Hollywood, like it just made us being able to connect with you guys. Like it felt like I could have been the guy at the pool and I would have walked up and, and kind of seen you guys. So it was just kind of cool seeing you guys in a, in a different light. And those scenes were just so funny with uh, ben, Sir oh. Ben. Oh my God. That, you know, we were nervous about it because we were told we had to call him Sir Ben and, you know, don't talk to him unless he wants to talk to you. And it was the complete opposite. We did call him Sir Ben, but he was so open. We had so much fun that day sitting around the pool. All we did was just, we were just sitting in that little cabana by the pool yeah. that was out in LA and um, where I live, but that's, we shot right here in LA. 
uh, and it was just a great day. And then you had Lauren Bacall, who yeah. remember the first thing I mentioned, I was a big fan of Humphrey Bogart early yeah. on. And uh, my, one of my favorite movies is To Have and Have Not, which was her first movie. And, she, and, we, and then Christopher references it mm -hmm. in that scene. Mm -hmm. And I was already a big Lauren Bacall. I, I fell in love with her in that movie. And, uh, and now here she is. I'm shooting with her and we're talking about that movie. It was just, it, it, like you said, that was, sometimes it was hard to, if you look at our faces when she walks up, we have this kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was real. Very little acting there. That was really just, the, I, you know, I mean, how could you just not be, I can't believe I'm talking to Lauren Bacall. That was pretty much the, uh, and then, and then of course, you know, it's funny you mentioned Mad Men because that episode was written by uh, Matt Weiner. Mm -hmm wrote that episode. I think that was the first full episode of The Sopranos he wrote. And then of course he created Mad Men after yeah. that. Yeah, so, uh, so, and he wrote, and I had that great line at the end of that scene, enjoy your success, which yeah. is such a brilliant line. It's, it's such a simple, you know, three words. And uh, so many people quote that line back at me. It's one of the you know, most often quoted lines. So that, that was a fun scene. Yeah. Because you, you'd done, uh, I think it was season four is when you came on. It was season four, five, and then 6A and 6B. And right. um, yeah, definitely uh, uh, the role of Little Carmine kind of changed a lot from where, when he came in in season four to where he kind of right. ended in season six. Because like in season four, season five, you know, Little Carmine was, you know, again, like he was, you know, pressing to take over the business. He was more intimidating. He was actually calling on... Not, not so much calling on hits, but like he was capable of doing it and, you know, running the business. Uh, and obviously, you know, the, those scenes that you had with, um, you know, with, with Carmine, you know, your dad were, were so good. And you know, he was, he was a great boss uh, as well. Um, one yeah. of definitely, I think the most realistic boss out of, uh, out of all the families that we saw with was Carmine Lupertazzi senior. And I think yeah, he was one he was old school too, so it kind of it it kind of was a throwback to the the bosses that we kind of knew from the past. Yeah, for sure. And even Junior respected him because uh, when he passed, yeah. and I think it was Bobby that was saying that it was uh, Carmine that invented point shaving or the something. Yeah, point shaving. Is what it was. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, as far as, uh, you know, kind of how did you find yourself on the role? Was the, the Little Carmine role the role that you initially auditioned for, or were there other roles you were interested in? I auditioned for one role before, um, you know, I live out in L.A. Yeah. Uh, and they cast most, they rare, very rarely cast anybody out in L.A. But I had done a TV show, I don't know, 25, 30 years earlier, called uh, Pros and Cons. It was a guest star part on a show with uh, Richard Krenner and James Earl Jones. But the writer on the show, it was his first writing job ever, was Frank Renzulli, who was a writer on the first season of The Sopranos. And he was a writing partner of Terry Winters. So, so when the show started, he kind of told Terry, oh, watch this episode of the first thing I ever did. So then Terry had me in mind because of that one guest star 30 years earlier. So. Uh, they had me audition for the part of the guy that does the intervention for Christopher. Oh, it yeah. Was yeah. One scene. Right. Yeah, Elias Cotes does it. Yeah. And he does a great job. And uh, I thought, you know, I put myself on tape. And in those days, I can't believe it was so long ago, it was VHS tape. So you had to put yourself on tape and FedEx it by 4.30 to get to New York. So um, I did that audition and uh, put myself on tape. And then a week later, they called me and said, no they're not gonna use you for that, but they like you, so maybe something better. And you know, that's the classic line you hear when you don't get a part. That's oh, what your yeah. agent tells you when you don't get a part. Oh no, they liked you, but maybe, maybe something in the future. And you always think, yeah, sure, I'll wait for that. But then about a week or two later, they called and they said, uh, he wants you to read for the part of Little Carmine. So I thought, oh, well, that's great. And then I read it and it said, Little Carmine, anything but little, upwards of 250 pounds, sweating profusely with a twitching eye. Oh, wow. Thought, well, you know, I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna get this. So, <laughs> I, uh, I, and so I actually called my agent. I said, I think there's a mistake here. This is, he can't want me. They said, no, David Chase, specifically after seeing your tape, wants you to read for this role. So I thought I have to do something. So I purposely, uh, 
mispronounced Versailles. I said Versailles instead of Versailles. Oh, wow. In my audition. In my audition. And, uh, and apparently that was one of the little things that, that uh, David Chase thought, okay, that's the guy. And it was only supposed to be a couple of episodes. They didn't know that Little Carmine was going to be a, become a series regular. At first, it was just going to be those couple of episodes just to kind of bridge between Big Carmine and Tony. And, uh, and then, well, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, no, I mean, that obviously worked out. I mean, I, I definitely think you could have, I mean, obviously you've done really well during the intervention scene, but I think Elias was just perfect for that role. Yeah, he, he really he had, was, yeah. He had to look a certain way, and, uh, you know, little Carmine, you know, was, was a little more put together. He looked like a New York boss, underboss. So yeah, it, it yeah. worked out. It worked out for us that uh, you ended up getting the little Carmine role. Well, more than working out for you, it worked out for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. As opposed to one episode, I ended up being on till the very end. And, and I'm going to be honest, my, my favorite genre of movies are, you know, are these mob movies and mob shows. And you know, I just kind of relate back to The Godfather and Casino and just the new movie, The Irishman. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a character quite like Little Carmine. I mean, did, how did you, I mean, I know it was written, but I mean, some of that still has to be you. I mean, did you do anything creatively to kind of make that character well, yours? Um, it, you know, it kind of just evolved. I think that first, you know, they gave me a little hint for the audition. They said he uses big words and he's, he thinks he's smarter than he really is. That was the first clue they gave me. So yeah. that's what made me say Versailles instead of Versailles in the audition. And then there was a little kind of gesture thing I did. Oh, I remember what, a, I, in the audition, I said, he's a bit of a poseur if you ask me. And I did like a thing with my neck. And I remember Terry Winter, like a year later told me, he said, you know, when David Chase saw you doing that thing with your neck, he said, okay, that's the guy. And it was kind of just, you know, saying the way I said poseur. So um, it kind of just evolved. And of course, then they wrote the brilliant malaprops that I had, you know, Stagmire and all those, they just, they just wrote those. Um, and a little subtle thing, you know, the thing about The Sopranos, there are so many mob characters, yet they're all so individual. Mm -hmm. That was what's so amazing. They all have their little idiosyncrasies. And I remember after those first two episodes, I guess it was the beginning of season five, I went for a, they were making me a series regular now, and I went for a wardrobe fitting. And um, Juliet uh, Peloska, I, I think it's her last name, she had my wardrobe set up and I noticed cowboy boots and cowboy shirts and a cowboy belt. And I said, what's this about? She said, David Chase just wants you to wear cowboy boots and a cowboy belt from now on. And if you look, I wear them in every scene. Yeah. And they, they rarely focus on it. You only see the boots maybe in one scene. I think when we're editing Cleaver, my feet are up on the desk or something and you see the boots, but I had the cowboy belt. And even in that Stagmire scene, I'm wearing kind of a Western shirt with snap, yeah. you know, so it's very subtle. So it was just those kind of little idiosyncrasies that David Chase added. And then once you get the hints in the script, you know, with the malaprops, um, you kind of just, just run with it. And it kind of just keeps building and building. Um, so that's, it just, I just kept building on what they were giving me. And I guess they kind of liked it and they built and then it just, it becomes what it is. It's, it's a really, it's a very organic process if you have good writing. Yeah. If you have good writing, the whole thing just kind of happens, uh, happens naturally. And plus when you're working opposite somebody like Gandolfini, you know, yeah. you just have to say your lines and you're going to be pretty damn good. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you have any, um, I mean, I'm sure there was a bunch, but I mean, was there a memorable uh, James Gandolfini story that you could share? I have a million of them. You know, every time you worked with him, there was a story. Uh, uh, you know, well, I can, I'll tell you, I don't think I've told this story. Um, the first scene I shot was the, was the sit down scene in Miami. And we shot that at the Fountain Blue Hotel, which yeah. is a big famous hotel in Miami. And I live in LA. So that I flew in and I had never met anybody because I got cast on tape. So usually you meet the directors, the casting director. So I had never really met anybody. So here I am in Miami, never meeting anybody. And I'm in the hotel and... Uh, Eileen Landris calls and says, uh, uh, Jim is at a club down in South Beach. Let's go meet him. So she took me and we went to the, this, and there was a big line outside the club to get in and we couldn't get in. 
the you know bouncers there. So she calls Jim's cell phone, and then he comes to the door, and he greets us, and she introduces me, and I shake his hand, and he just has this, this massive hand, and I was just like, you know, at that point, I'm just a fan. You know, I had been acting forever, but sometimes he had a presence. Yeah. in person that was equal to the presence he had as Tony Soprano, a completely different persona. Yeah. But the essence and the aura that he had was had that kind of power. And I remember we walked through this, this nightclub in, in South Beach that was packed and the music's blasting. And I swear, the crowd would just part as he walked through. And it's like every single eye in the club was, was just on him. And I was walking behind him, so I was like in the wake <laughs> the wake of Dan Delfini as I walked through the crowd and I just and I just watched him and he was just a regular guy we just sat around and he was he was wonderful and then I'd look around and I'd see every single person in this place is staring at him <laughs> you know and it was just it was just a, and that night of course then we were going to shoot the next day and uh, we had to shoot at night after the restaurant actually closed so I don't think we started shooting till midnight or something but there were hundreds of people because it's a working hotel so besides the extras, around the whole perimeter, hundreds of people watching this film. Now this is my first scene. I'm meeting him for the first time. So I couldn't sleep well the night before and I woke up with this nightmare shot. It's a classic actor nightmare that I said in my first line and he says to me, that's not your line. This is in my dream. So I sit down at the table getting ready to rehearse the scene and uh, I deliver my first line and he says, that's not your line. I swear, they had rewritten the scene since my audition and because I was out in LA I never got the changes it wasn't very different but just the first couple of lines were different so I had to just like look at it real fast and go okay <laughs> let's do it and uh but he was just uh he like I said he was just a remarkable actor to work with and uh he gave you so much you just had to kind of react to what he was giving you and you were automatically pretty damn good yeah no I mean a lot of your guys, uh, the scenes between um, Little Carmine and, and Tony, there was a lot of, uh, it was always over like a meal. You guys were always having dinner. It was always on like a golf course or like a restaurant. And um, there was always a, um, a story that, you know, Little Carmine would say. And then like Tony would just listen to him and like you just, you just know he didn't get it. But, but, <laughs> like, but uh, it's just great. Yeah, yeah. The writing in those scenes were, were always were always really good. And those are what I really cherished those because I was fortunate to have those one on one scenes with Tony. And there was a very, you know, I think that relationship was much more complex than people think. You know, I know they they thought little Carmine was, you know, an idiot. You know, um, you know, they called him various, various names. But I, I think there was a there was a kind of a respect. I, the image I always had, the, what I used for the two of them, I figured they were about the same age. His father was one of the bosses in New York. My father was the boss. I saw them as kind of like first cousins. You know, you have first cousins that you live far away from, but maybe on a holiday you get together and you're really, really close and then you don't see them for six months. But because you're at a big family event or a picnic or something, you hang out with this one kid that's kind of your age. And, yeah. and I kind of felt that maybe that was the relationship that little Carmine and and Tony had over the years. Uh, you know, they probably knew each other from the time they were little kids, completely unrelated to the business. That was, you know, that was in my own head, but it kind of worked within those scenes, I think. Yeah, I mean, little Carmine, I mean, technically, I mean, he didn't lose any power. I mean, anytime there was, uh, he was always the broker between Jersey yeah. and New York, always. And every scene, he, even at the very end, the last scene, he was still the broker. Um, between what's what was left with New York and then with with Jersey, so um, I mean, and he actually, if you see, he actually, he gives the subtle nod to to Butchie to go ahead and say it's okay to hit Phil. So yeah. you know, reluctant. That was your decision. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So and of course he says, which is I only have one line in that whole episode, which is I was so glad I was in it, but I think it's a it didn't have to be like this. It didn't have to be this way. Yeah, is that it? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, I just, some, I just love the simplicity of it. I love. I think, you know, I think he had a, a bigger view of of what the situation is than most of the guys. He wasn't as transactional as, as some of the other characters. I think he saw the big picture. I think that speech he says to Tony at the golf course about, 
you know, it's not about being boss. It's about being happy. I think really became his philosophy because you said like the character developed. And I think ultimately that was what he came to after he saw the bloodshed, after, he, you know, Lorraine was killed and Rusty was killed. And, you know, uh, he never really got the revenge for Rusty that he thought. Um, I think he started to see the big picture and he thought, you know what? I have enough money. I could be happy. I could just... You know, it's more, it, there are more important things in life. And I think he saw, the, he saw the bigger picture. And at the end, you know, you see how everything worked out. I think he probably ended up uh, having the best life after the show. So Yeah, I mean, who, who knows? For all we know, he may have slipped into being the boss. Um, maybe Butchie we don't over. We don't know. Um, but going back to that scene, definitely, I mean, you feel that it had an impact on Tony. Because Tony even though he was totally. trying to understand the message, but like you felt like it resonated and it yeah. probably um, resulted in the decisions that he ended up making later on that season. Um, but what I, what I remember from that line is that, um, and, I, and I hope I'm not uh, mistaken the scenes, but in that scene, uh, you know, you order, ordered the, uh, the Arnold Palmer. Uh, but before that, you, there it is. <laughs> there it is. I point this to you, man. Perfect. <laughs> I knew it. Go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say because I have a theory about the Arnold Palmer too. And I actually talked to Terry Winter about it recently. Go ahead. Because <laughs> yeah, you had ordered a different drink and then you would switch it to the Arnold Palmer and you're like, you know, I've always wanted to order them, but I never, you know, think about it in the yeah. moment to actually order it. And you also ordered a salad. I'm forgetting which type of salad it was. So you ordered Seared, seared ahi and mixed greens. That's what it was. That's what it was. So it's this and, and meal. The complete opposite of Tony, and that's that's the brilliant of the that's the brilliance of uh, Terry Winter writing the Arnold Palmer joke the uh, line, because I I order Tony's already mad at me. You could tell he's already my first line. I think is you're not happy, something like that. Yeah. So um, when, when I order, I'll have the seared ahi and the mixed greens and an iced tea, and he says Philly cheesesteak, almost yeah. like he's putting it in my face. I'm yeah. not eating that what you're eating. So then I see that he's having an Arnold Palmer. And whether I want one or not, the idea that 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 little Carmine's smart enough to find a commonality, I think, right. you know, I think he does that to find the connection with Tony within that scene. You know, right. <clears throat> it's subtle, but that's what I used in that particular moment when I order it. So that's why I'm drinking one with you right now. That's awesome. That's awesome. And that that to me is probably my favorite little Carmine scene is that scene that you guys have and that line, I always remember it. Um, yeah. That's one of my favorite uh, little Carmine scenes. Um, you know, that's, that's it's a awesome. Great, there's, a lot, there's a lot in that scene. If you really peel that scene apart, uh, it's very layered. And then there's another scene with Tony that's when I get, go to, to get him to go have the, uh, to go to Phil, hat in hand on bended knee. And then he hits and, the right? <laughs> Yeah, right. That I wasn't expecting. When yeah. he did that, that was it. <laughs> but in that scene, there's a lot of subtle stuff that goes on. If you notice, um, I think Carmine's very sincere when he says, if you need any help with AJ, you know, I completely understand. Where the other guys, I think, do lip service to him just to say what, what they want to say, what the boss wants to hear. But I really believe that little Carmine was friend to friend. If there's anything I could do with AJ, I understand my daughter had some issues, you know, and I think... I think he came from a very sincere place in that scene. And then, and then there's a thing about, about the, um, the construction project and little karma. And I say, we're all losing money. And I say, it's easy for you to say, you know, I have the scaffolding contract. And Tony says, is that what this is about, little Carmine? And then Carmine says, come on, Tony, you know me better than that. And Tony completely backs down. Why? Because he does know Carmine better than that. He knows that Carmine's not here for the scaffolding contracts to get his, to get his money. He really sees the bigger picture. He really wants peace. He really wants Tony to make peace with Phil at this point. And it's for Tony's own good, you know, and he gets Tony to admit at that point that Tony law that uh, he was wrong. Yeah. You know, he was wrong in what he did that he went too far. Yeah. That, that scene where you guys both go to uh, Phil Leotardo's house and, you know, you <laughs> knocking on the door and he has an answer and then Butchie comes in and he's up top. And yeah. Uncle Philly, Uncle Philly, my ass. <laughs> Uncle Philly, my ass. Okay, speaking of ass, I'm going to tell you another little story about that scene. When I'm talking to, to Butchie at the door, Jimmy was right here over my shoulder, right? 
and I'm talking to, to Butch, Jim's hand off camera was on my ass. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> he was just, while, we're t while I'm talking, come on, Butchie, I just talked to him an hour ago, whatever. And he, Jim had his hand <laughs> on my ass for one of those takes, and it was just like, okay, try to keep a straight face. That was a, that was a fun day. Yeah, I, I got to ask, um, you know, because and you, you did appear in the uh, in the last episode, and I'm sure obviously you've seen the uh, the finale. What was your take on the uh, the finale? Do you think uh, Tony was killed at the end with all the signs that were pointing towards it, or do you think it just cut to black? I think it just cut to black. My feeling, I always felt that it's kind of life goes on. You know, the that restaurant we've never seen that restaurant in the show before. And if you look around that restaurant, uh, it's, and the name of the episode is called Made in America. I, my personal feeling is that David Chase was explaining that this show was not just about the Sopranos family and the New York mob and everything. This was about America. And if you look at that, there's a trucker, you know, there's a trucker sitting at the thing and there's a, a guy with Boy Scout leaders, there's a young couple. It really was, that restaurant, didn't seem New York and New Jersey. That restaurant was all of America in that restaurant. And then I got, the, my sense was that it goes to black. The camera was on Tony when it goes to black. So if anything had happened to him, we would have seen it, yeah. right? When it went black, my, my feeling is life is gonna go on. He was at his, that was the most peace he had ever been with his family. Whenever you've seen the four of them together. Yeah. And here's another thing. AJ echoes something that little Carmine said. He said something about, you always said something to me about, you know, finding the, the happy moments yeah. in life, that that's what's important. I think that goes back to that golf course scene from the season before, you know, that, and I think, you know, maybe that stuck with Tony and he, and he, so I, I get the feeling that life goes on. He's always going to have, have to watch the door you know, always never knowing what's going to happen, never knowing if someone's going to come from behind him. But he's just going to try to keep his family together and uh, both families. And uh, I just think, I just think life goes on. I, 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 you know, he never wrapped up anything. David Chase never, I mean, we don't know where the Russian is, right? We don't know where anybody is. We don't know where Melfi's rapist is, right? Life goes on. That's what happens in life. I mean, how many times you you have a really good friend and then you all of a sudden you stop seeing them and you never see them again for the rest of your life. Life just goes on. You think things are going to be a certain way and they're not. So I, that was my feeling and that's, and I'm sticking with it. Now that's a very good explanation. I mean, there's, there's definitely cases for, for both sides, but I, I tend to agree with, with your, your side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, I, I think it is. Yeah. People want the closure. They want to think, you know, if, if the guy had come out of the bathroom and popped Tony, all everybody would have said is, oh my God, what a godfather ripoff. The guy goes into the bathroom, comes out. You know, it would have been, it would have been a cliche at that point. Um, I thought it was a brilliant choice. You know, this wasn't a TV show. This was a complex novel that David Chase wrote. And that's the way I looked at it. And, you know, very often you end a novel and you close the book and you would be, God, I wish there was more. You know, it's the, you know, novels don't always end with that kind of that neat little wrapped up package. And he never ended any see every season ended people going, Oh, that was a ripoff. Now I got to wait a year. I don't know what happened. It didn't wrap up. He never wrapped anything up. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it life goes on. This is America. Yeah. You know, the corruption, this is just a microcosm of what America is. And I think that was the message of, of what he was trying to say.